It's a beautiful thing to be in the arms of our Savior. And he puts it in the likeness of a, a mother hen wanting to gather her chicks under its wings. One of my favorite scriptures is, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. We need to be safe. God has delivered us from this present evil world so that we may be safe. Amen? <clears throat> Father, I thank you for your word. You have kept your word. You have put it above your name. And you desire for us to be one with your word. It is a living word. So, today I'm asking you to speak to our hearts by your spirit that we may know and believe what you have said. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> one of the greatest fathers of the faith the church has ever known, once sat in prison writing a letter. He knew he only had a short time left on earth. His departure for heaven was at hand. So he wanted to put down on paper some final heartfelt words of advice for a dearly beloved spiritual son he wanted to leave Timothy, the young pastor he had trained in ministry, a letter full of instructions to keep him alive in his heart, to make sure Timothy would continue to grow and fulfill the will of God long after he was gone. Today, the Apostle Paul's letter, as a part of the New Testament, belongs to all of us. Here are six vital instructions drawn from its wisdom-filled pages. Six secrets that will help us all follow in Paul's footsteps and finish our spiritual race. Number one. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.1 If you've been saved more than a few months, most likely you've already discovered that the Christian life can be tough. It not only includes the blessings of God, but also includes persecutions, difficult circumstances, and pressures from the devil. To overcome such challenges, we must rely on the favor and power of God. We must be strong, as Paul says, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be strong in grace? We are all familiar with the definition of grace as God's unmerited favor. Yes, we don't deserve it. No, we can't earn it. It is freely given by the unconditional love of God for us. But to more accurately define grace, we have to say it is God who empowers us to do what we can't do for ourselves. No, we can't earn it, and no, we don't deserve it. But because of God's great love for us, He gave us His Son to pay the price for us to freely have all things that pertain to life and godliness. <clears throat> Titus 2, 11-13 tells us 
the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. According to those verses, grace teaches us how to live godly lives. That why the, that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace. He corrects us and instructs us. He tells us what changes we need to make in our thoughts, our speaking right words, and our proper actions to triumph in every situation. What every Christian needs to learn is that they can do nothing in their own power, in their own ability. But desire this grace by submitting to the Holy Spirit who empowers us with this grace to be able to do what is necessary to get the victory. To be strong in grace, we must cooperate with Him. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. When He tells you to change something in your life, that's not pleasing to God. Don't feel like He's mistreating you or being hard on you. Everything He tells us is for our good. He is in us to teach and empower us to think, talk, and act like God so we can live like God lives. <clears throat> in freedom, in light, and in victory. When He speaks corrections to our heart or gives us instruction from the Word, we need to be quick to respond. We should say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Repent and challenge. Be strong in grace. Number two, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.3 Soldiers don't cave in and faint when things get hard. They don't throw down their weapons and stop doing what they're trained to do just because they find themselves facing the enemy. According to Paul, as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, we don't either. We don't stop believing and doing what the Word of God says when we're under pressure. We don't fall apart when persecution and affliction come. We know those things are from the devil. They're the weapons he uses to steal the word out of our hearts and gain access to our lives. We found that out in Mark chapter 4, the sowing of the seed in the ground. So instead of giving up on your faith when we encounter them, we do the opposite. We double up on our word time and our prayer time. We double up on confessing of our faith and speak what God says about the situation. As James 1.4 says, we let patience have her perfect work. Patience is a force that does not yield to circumstances or succumb to defeat. Patience is not just putting up with a situation for a time. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a constantly <clears throat> persevering spirit. It's ever expecting and believing. It's a part of God's own nature, which we receive when we are born again because it's inside us. 
we can put patience to work in our lives whenever we choose. The problem is we don't always choose to. We don't always feel like being good soldiers. Sometimes we want to say, I'm tired of fighting. I win one battle and there are a hundred more knocking on my door. As an encouraging reminder, we are fighting the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12 The reason it's a good fight is because we have all the resources of God to win. The truth is, we're fighting an enemy who has already been defeated. Our victory is a done deal if we will only let patience have its perfect work. Number three, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4 Many years ago, I discovered for myself just what can happen when you are overlooking this third word of advice from Paul. I let myself get so preoccupied with the natural activities and responsibilities of life that my attention to the things of God began to slip. I had been living the faith life for several years. My circumstances had improved to the point where I had gotten comfortable. I didn't have to believe God every time I went to the grocery store for enough money to pay the bill. I wasn't sick, broke, or in any manner in any major trouble at all. The Word was working in my life. So no longer driven by desperation to focus so much on the Lord, I got busy with other things. One day the Spirit of God spoke to my heart as Brother Hagen was pre prophesying about the end time army of God. He said, you can become a part of that army if you will only rise up and become on fire. Suddenly I realized how spiritually lukewarm I'd become. I thought to myself, I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines while God is on the move. I want to be right in the middle of His will, fighting on the front lines. Determined to make a change, I decided to set my heart ablaze for God again by giving Him more of my time. Every, chain, every chance I got, I would be in prayer and in His Word. I would stir up my spirit by reading sermons by Kenneth Hagin or E.W. Kenyon. I would listen to tapes by Kenneth Copeland and Jerry Savelle and Charles Capps. Before long, I found myself fired up again and out sharing the knowledge of my faith with others. Because of that experience, I understand very well why Paul said, Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. I know what can happen when the busyness of life crowds God out. Most likely you do too. So see to it that God always has first place in your life. Don't let anything, not your occupation, your hobbies, or even a ministry, get the top spot in your heart. There is only one room enough. There's only one. There's only room enough. And God wants that place. <clears throat> and by spending time with God all through your day, He will always occupy that place. Number four, constantly keep in mind Jesus Christ and Him crucified, risen from the dead. 2 Timothy 2.8 
If you want to live your life as a winner, day in and day out, center your attention on this one familiar fact. Jesus has risen from the dead. Obviously, as Christians, we believe that. It's foundational to our faith. But why does Paul identify it as one of the keys to continual victory? Why must we always keep it at the forefront of our mind? Because when Jesus rose from the dead and conquered the devil, he did it for us. He didn't do it for himself as the Son of God. He wasn't subject to sin, sickness, poverty, or any of the rest of Satan's works. He wasn't defeated in any way, but you and I were. So he came and won every battle on our behalf. He got the victory and gave it to us. The Bible says that when Jesus rose from the dead, we were raised with him. We were made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.6. We became joint heirs with him, Romans 8.17. It's amazing, but it's true. The resurrected Jesus is Lord. He's supreme over everything. All authority in heaven and earth is His, Matthew 28, 18. And He has given His authority to us. Now I want to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23. And you're all familiar with this. It's been read, quoted several times here. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? That's the Holy Spirit, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, you, which is, that fullness of Him that fills all of you. We have the power and authority over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing by any means can hurt you. It shouldn't. <clears throat> I hope you can see that. I hope you can look at those words and think about them and see what Jesus did for us. <clears throat> if we constantly keep this in mind, nobody, even the devil, won't be able to talk us into losing. When he tells us we're going to fail, we won't be able to pay our bills, we're going to get sick and die, or some other horrible lie, we won't believe him. Instead, we will say, Jesus rose from the dead, got the victory for me, and I have it. I cannot be defeated, because through Jesus, I've already won. Number five, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When Paul wrote these words of instruction, Timothy wasn't a kid. He wasn't even in his 20s or 30s. 
He was a 40-year-old minister who had been studying the Word for years. But Paul knew that if Timothy wanted to stay on course, he would have to persist in studying the Scriptures. He'd have to keep the word of truth in front of him at all times. The same is true for us. I know it from experience. I've found that if I don't continually feed on the word, my thinking doesn't stay straight. I begin to let important truths and faith principles slip. Even though I've walked in them for years, they fade into the background and I fail to act on them. Always remember, it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. That will bring the victory into your life. When sickness comes your way, for instance, it's not enough to mentally understand that it is God's will for you to be healed. You must act on that knowledge. You must believe you receive your healing when you pray. Mark 11. You must speak to the sickness and command it to leave your body. But you will have to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Jesus gave us the example in Matthew chapter 7 of two men that heard the word. They both heard the same word. The foolish man was building his house on sand by not doing what he heard. And when the storms of life blew against that house, it fell. It says great was its fall. But the other one was a wise man. He heard the word and was a doer of it, building his house on the rock. And when the same storms of life came against his house, it stood, could not be destroyed. <clears throat> we must constantly study and keep the word in our hearts and minds. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. That's why God said to Joshua when he was leading the Israelites into the promised land, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. It doesn't mean don't say it. Don't let it out of your mouth. It means just the opposite. Don't stop saying what the word of God says. Don't let it depart from your mouth, but meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do. To observe means to see. So you'll be able to see to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt be victorious. You will have good success. The word keeps you thinking right. When your thinking is right, your words are right. When your words are right, your actions are right. When your actions are right, you have the victory. So study the word, not just to accumulate information, but to assimilate the truth of it. Meditate on it until it becomes a part of you. Become impregnated with the Word of God. Integrate it into your heart until it influences your every thought. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Number six. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 <clears throat> This entire scripture is important. It reveals 
one of the greatest secrets to avoiding temptation and living a successful Christian life. What is that secret? Keeping company with them that call on the Lord after a pure heart. The people we choose to fellowship with can make all the difference in the outcome of our lives. The companionship of strong believers helps us grow stronger ourselves. Their faith encourages our faith. The reverse is also true. Fellowshipping with people who are living in sin is downright dangerous. They will tempt us to do things we know we shouldn't do and dampen our fire for God. Evil companionships, communion, associations, corrupt and depraved good manners, and morals and character. 1 Corinthians 15.33, the Amplified Version. That's not to say we can't reach out to the lost. We can and should minister to them. I have always said one of two things will happen. Either you will be influenced or you will be the one who influences them. By habitually integrating these six instructions that Paul has given us will clearly make us the influential party. So let's follow Paul's counsel and surround ourselves with godly Bible-believing, faith-talking people. Let's heed the wise counsel of this great father of the faith. Let's be strong in grace, endure hardness, put God first, keep in mind our resurrected Lord, and continually feed on the Word. Then someday, you too can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my race, I have kept the faith. Then you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us good instruction, good counsel from the Holy Spirit by your written word. Now your word was written so that we may be able to have it to study, read, meditate on, and then activate it in our lives by our actions. Because your word is a living word, but it only becomes alive and living in us after we act on it. That's the living word in our lives. We thank you so much, Father, that you have brought all of us together to receive what, you, what we need from you. Now we ask that we not just hear it here and leave and not be a doer of it, but we all leave here with more knowledge, more understanding, and begin to apply it to our lives so that we too may also say, I have the victory, and I'm taking this victory to the world so that they may have victory also. We give you all praise, glory, and honor, as always, in Jesus' name. Amen.